It's been quite a while since I updated my current home lab setup, and oh boy, there has been a lot of changes. Even down to the dashboard here, I used to use Heimdall, and this is Homar, just one of the many changes or additions. Now, in this video, what we're going to be doing is an overview of all the services running on my home lab and briefly talk about how just everything is set up. Now, unlike a lot of other videos, I'm not going to bore you by talking about my firewall and database setup for the next 15 minutes. Instead, most of the things that you're going to see in this video can be easily spun up just with a Docker container, as most things on my network are simply that. Easy to understand kind of front-facing applications that most people in my household have access to and use on a daily basis. Now, this video is sponsored by Private Internet Access. I'm going to talk about that a little bit more when I get to these uh, download clients here. Now, starting off with the dashboard, this is the first thing you're seeing, and it is beautiful. This is Homar, one of the reasons why I went with this, other than obviously the appearance is the integration with the R suite of applications, which you can see right here. For example, right here, this is a calendar. It's actually going to tell me when there's going to be new episodes released that links up to Sonar so it can see what I have in my media server and let me know when things change. We have a current download speed. This links up to those download clients. You can see this is my torrent client kind of integrated into here so I could see what is going on. Scrolling back up, this is linked up to Overseer so I could see all the requests on my server. This is linked up to both Jellyfin and Plex so I can see what is being streamed from my home server. And overall, customization is really nice. For a while there, I was using the uh, container called Homepage, which is also pretty, but that is configured with text documents or text files. This, you can enter edit mode, and from here you can go ahead, change, manipulate, move things around, click on a application, edit, and then have access to everything you need, save that, exit save changes. It's really easy to mess with and configure this. It also supports Docker integration, so if I click on Docker, you can see all the containers. This can read all the containers that are running on the same instance or the same server that this is running on. So you can see a lot of the services right here. It is missing some, which I'll talk about a little bit later, but we can see the ports, we can see its current state, the image, and a lot more. And here you can actually kind of manage it, start, stop, remove, and add it to Homer through here if you would like to. Additionally, there are some additional settings. So if I go over here, go to settings, we can change the default search. We can download the config. We have some customizations here for the layout grid stack, all the way down to appearance, one which you can change here, including custom CSS, which is very nice. Additionally, they do have a light mode, uh, which frankly I would not recommend. And that right there is what's gonna go on in this video. I'm going to be going over all of these applications, giving you a very brief rundown of what it is and how I use it. And if you are interested, leave a comment down below and I might make a full video on something that I'm going to cover if you guys are interested. Now, one thing to understand about my home network, which will kind of help you understand how everything's set up, is I have three primary devices. I have a Synology NAS, which we're going to talk about at the end. We have an Unraid server, which is running on a, um, I think it's a TerraMaster NAS. And then we have just a standard Ubuntu install with Protainer running independently on an Intel Nook. Now we're gonna start with the Intel Nook because that is what is running Plex at the moment. If I go to Protainer right here, let's zoom in just a bit and let's live connect to this instance. You can see this has 16 different containers, definitely not as pretty of a setup, but this is running Plex Protainer, which we're currently in Watchtower, which is a really nice Docker application that will automatically kind of scan, pull and update your containers for you really nice. I will be making a dedicated video on that. So do make sure you subscribe, ring that bell. We have both Teslamate and Kazam, which we're going to be diving into. But first, Plex. Plex right here, this is my main media server and there's a lot of reasons for it. I did a whole separate video kind of going over my reasonings. Primarily, Plex just works a little bit better when it comes to sharing externally. And not that it works better, it works easier for people who aren't experienced with like IP addresses and all that. I could add my grandma directly to my kind of home share, for example. She logs into Plex and all my stuff automatically just shows up. Pretty cool. Overall, Plex works great. I like the features. I never use kind of the uh, music or their specific live stream stuff, which you can find down here. Never use any of that. This is all my media right here. 
If we go to activity, for example, dashboard, we could see we do have the voice streaming from an Apple TV. That's another reason why I kind of prefer Plex. Now, of course, you probably saw Jellyfin right here. Now I run both and they're just connected. It's pretty easy to the exact same library to the exact same server. And Jellyfin is more of a backup service because there are definitely cons to Plex. And that is if you're trying to stream stuff offline. Plex doesn't like that. It gets kind of weird. This is very helpful. If for some reason I'm having uh, network issues, I have CenturyLink here, so it's gonna happen. <laughs> Jellyfin works great. Again, I use this if I'm having network issues. And another reason I kind of like Plex is it's just a bigger application. There's a lot more third-party tools and services, and this right here, Datuli, is one of them. So gonna sign in with Plex real quick. And here we go, we get a whole bunch of additional data and statistics about my specific Plex server. We have play counts here. Better Call Saul is super popular on my server. We have Bones. My grandma's watching Roseanne. I've been watching The Handmaid's Tale. And we have a lot more data. And if we go into graphs, we can see a lot of that here. We can see the play count by media type, play count by hour. So if I'm going to do server maintenance or something like that, I might want to do it between 9 and 10 a.m. because those are the hours that there's absolutely no activity on the server. Play count by platform, top users, just a lot of stuff. Stream type, play totals, duration, last 12 months. We could see specific history. So we could see everything that has been streaming here for how long, how long it was paused. Just a ridiculous, unnecessarily ridiculous amount of data. But that's just one thing I'm addicted to is having access to a ridiculous amount of data. So that is my media playback stuff, at least when it comes to video, TV shows, music. Now I'm gonna talk about my download clients. And for that, we have NZB Git and Divulge, or Divulge VPN. This does have an integrated VPN. Real quick, I'm gonna to go to my Unraid instance here, which kind of, kind of give me a better way to explain how this works. So here is everything running on my Unraid instance. We have the VPN here and we have NZB Git. Now, this has a built-in VPN. I'm using OpenVPN with private internet access. And what I'm doing is I'm feeding nzbgit through divulge. So it says the network for the nzbgit container is this container here. So that means I have a VPN set up on both of my download clients. Now, last time I did this, I did leak my password. I'm not gonna do that again. We have the user, the password, the actual VPN provider, PIA is one of the default ones here. And they were kind enough to sponsor this video. If you don't know what a VPN is, basically it is a way to hide your IP address from prying eyes. My main use case is torrents. If I'm downloading something like an Ubuntu torrent, for example, I don't really want people seeing my IP address. When you use torrents, your IP becomes public because you are connected to other peers and they can see that. What private internet access will do is one, encrypt your connection to one of their own servers. And then from there, other people who can see your IP address will see it as that server that you're connecting to instead of your actual personal IP address. You can also use it to connect to various places in the world. PIA has a bunch of different locations that you can pick from and basically pretend that's where you are. Another thing, there's actually a graphical utility for Linux, which is very nice. Not a lot of them actually do that, including Windows, Mac, Android, iPhone, really whatever you need. And this right here is what I'm actually kind of using for the Docker container. We have the OVPN files, this is directly from PIA support. These are the configuration files. That's what I'm personally using for my uh, kind of home lab setup. If you check out the link down below, you can get 83% off and four extra months completely for free. And when it comes to the actual kind of user interface, this is the torrent client. It's very standard when it comes to torrents. You can add, remove, pause, start, up, down. If I go into preferences, for example, you can customize just about everything where it goes. I have everything at least in a data root directory because then a lot of other applications such as Sonar Raider can see all that and move files around accordingly. That's very important. If I go to network here, you can see it's using the TUN0, which is the actual VPN tunnel. And if the VPN ever for some reason, like, if I forget to pay it or whatever, it won't work. It will automatically disconnect and I'll just get a bunch of errors, which is good. Now, NZBGit is a little bit more complicated. This uses what's called news servers to actually find and pull various files. For example, if you're downloading, what's the, ah, there it is, Big Buck Bunny. 
NZB clients are a little more complicated because you need both a news server, which kind of houses all the files, and you need a indexer separately that can actually kind of locate various files and put them together. So for example, if you want to download a Big Buck Bunny MP4, it might be split up in between a variety of locations in like a bunch of RAR part files. And then NZB Git mixed with your indexer and news server will automatically download all those separate parts, extract it together, and then move it to where it needs to be. And this right here is what NZB Git looks like. It's very similar to a torrent client, except for in the back end, it does a lot more different things. And I like NZB Git. One, it's written in C++, so it's a little quicker than the alternative. And two, I like just how the interface is set up. We have our news servers, categories, RSS feeds, everything we want to put in here. So those are our download clients, and from there, I'm gonna go over to the R suite of applications. Some of these I'm not gonna open up. I'm just gonna give you a brief description of at least Prowler. Prowler is a place that you're gonna put your indexers, and then you can link up like Sonar Radar to Prowler, and it'll automatically pull your indexers into those two applications. It's really nice, really easy to use. Radar and Sonar do the exact same things. This is for movies, this is for shows. Now this right here is kind of the default page of Radar, for example. What it does is you link it up to your media server, it'll automatically pull everything in for you. So for example here we can see some of the Back to the Futures. If I am to click on this one, for example, it gives you a lot of information about your media, so we can see the location. Some information here, we could go over to the cast, the crew, we could see the files. There's a search functionality, which you really shouldn't use because you should be backing up your very own media into this and using it for things such as the uh, preview rename. This is really nice. Let's say you have a, uh, have a box set of friends and you ripped the entire box set and you don't want to go through and rename every single file. This, as long as it can kind of make out what the file is, it will do this for you and you can set custom variables and how you want this to work. For example, I do have the quality built into the names. This file doesn't have the quality. So all I would do is click organize and then it said it's been completed and now for history, we have the fact right here that it went ahead and renamed that file for us. So just one of the kind of cool functionalities with this. And then Sonar here is basically the exact same deal, but for TV shows. Now from there, Overseer is going to be another really cool one. If we sign in here, we sign in with our Plex account. There's also a, a Jellyfin alternative to this one that integrates with that instead of Plex. But here we can see a lot of things. We have our recently added, we have the recent requests. You can have like the people who are in your Plex instance sign into this and then find explore movies. So if I go over here to movies, for example, this is by popularity descending. So like Barbie is gonna be up here, Indiana Jones, Elemental, things like that. If I wanted like The Flash, for example, what I could do is send a request to the server administrator and then the server admin can uh, go out and buy a DVD of it, rip it, and then put it on the server so you can kind of stream it in your household without having to uh, plug in the good old DVD player. It's really cool though, the amount of data and statistics it gives you. You have like the release date, revenue, budget, typical like IMDB type stuff. But like finding things is cool because like we could go to series, for example, we could go to active filters and there are a lot of options. For example, if you're somebody who like has Netflix but doesn't have Hulu and you're like, I wonder what's popular on Hulu. You could click that and then we can see Law & Order, CIS, American Dad are the popular things on Hulu. So from there, we're gonna go to two more kind of media server services. One is Audio Bookshelf and I have talked about this in a whole dedicated video. This is really cool. It's basically your own version of Audible. If I go to this one right here, the body keeps score. We can see our audio tracks separated out by the chapters. I could go back to home here. Uh, don't judge my library too much. I got a lot of this in here for free, such as some of the history stuff and the libertarian mind. But if I go to like David Goggins Can't Hurt Me, you can see chapters because this was actually one I purchased and imported from Audible. Audible is actually kind of cool because it allows you to download the files you need to stream these on your own server. So it's kind of a benefit in that regard. But Audiobook Shelf, super cool service. I use it quite a bit. And if you want to go a little more old school, you don't want to listen to a book, you want to read a book. This right here is what I'm currently using. You can see the actual books I have in here. I have some textbooks. Cadillac Desert was a textbook for one of my classes. I'm reading Walkable City at the moment. And this is nice. If I open up Walkable City, we could read it as is. Or if I click on this, for example, we have a bunch of different options to customize it to be uh, 
visually how we'd prefer it from font size, the actual line spacing, the margin, so you can make it substantially skinnier if you'd like to. And then we have some other reader settings that may be helpful and then color theming. So really cool, nice little reading tool, something I would definitely recommend if you have some sort of ebook library. The alternative to this would be Calibre Web, which is also another phenomenal tool, but I just think that this is prettier. From there, another service that I'm running, which honestly I haven't used as much as I should, is called Fresh RSS. This is a RSS reader and kind of collection tool. I open this up probably once a week or so and kind of skim through it. You can see I use it for a lot of uh, Linux news. I have a gaming on Linux, OMG Ubuntu. So here you can see everything. I could star things. Toggle as read if I open it. So um, this OMG Ubuntu article, if I click on this, I could see some of the article here or I could click on it to view the entire thing if I'm interested in that. I could favorite it, so if there's a bunch of headlines that are interesting to me, I can favorite them and then head back to it later. And there's a bunch of other settings. We have our subscription management here, so you can see my Linux category. We have uncategorized here. You can add various categories, and it's a really, really nice utility. I used to run an RSS reader on my desktop computer, but I'm always switching things around and uninstalling things. Having a service like this always just available and ready in a Docker container on my home lab is definitely the preference. And from there, at least in these top two rows, we have Mealy. Now this is a very, very new addition. And by very, very new, I mean probably the last couple days I've added this and started playing around with it, but it seems super cool. And I'm gonna be using it more and more as I learn it. It is a meal kind of aggregation tool that allows you to pull recipes from sources on the internet. For example, here I have some roasted broccoli soup. It has all the steps, the ingredients, and overall it works really good. If I go to the original URL, it's gonna open up all of recipes and this is where I pulled it from. And there's like ads and everything on this. It's not a very fun experience. Uh, just an example, if I go to salads here and I wanted to make, ugh, this looks really good. Let's say I wanted this recipe right here. I would grab the URL, go back to my kind of self-hosted instance, click on create, import recipe by URL, paste it in, click create, and in a matter of a second or two, boom, there we go. And of course you don't have to just input, you could create your own recipes manually. There's cookbooks, tags, categories, timeline. They have shopping lists, which you can make based on recipes you wanna cook out of a meal planner. Bunch of different stuff I haven't explored as much as I would like to, but it's something I've started, as I said, getting more and more into. From there, we have Tesla Mate. I currently have a uh, Model 3, got a pretty good deal after like the tax credit and all that. I'm gonna have to be really touchy because I'm not trying to show you guys exactly where I am, but here we have a little map. Gives you my Tesla, the status, the range, a bunch of different data, but where it gets real crazy is if we go over here into dashboards, we have a comically large amount of statistics. If I go to statistics, this opens up a Grafana dashboard. Now here we can see just on this little dashboard here, we have this month. If I go to this month, you could see a whole heck of a lot. We have a map of everywhere I've traveled. We have the distance, the net internet use. We have the distance, the net electricity usage, the charging versus driving time. Down here we have links to very specific drives. So I opened up this drive here. This doesn't really have any um, sensitive information. This is a drive from a rec center to KFC. And we can see here just a absolutely comically ridiculous amount of data, specific distance, energy used. In this chart, we have speed, power, battery heater, range, rated, and estimate. We have tire pressure. If we go here, we have the elevation changes in this specific drive. And as we kind of chase or trace through this chart, you could see the exact location on when the data is collected. And if I go down, I could see like temperatures and things, just an absolute comical amount of stuff. There are like other third party applications for this, but the problem with those in my opinion is then you're just uploading all your like very specific travel data into some third party server somewhere. This frankly is completely unnecessary, but it's pretty cool. It's on my server, so I'm way more comfortable kind of having something collect all this. Granted the Tesla and Tesla themselves are probably collecting it themselves anyways, but you win some, you lose some. And just a little overview, these are all the different charts. We have status, statistics, timeline. This is in Grafana, which is beautiful as you saw. Drive status, drives, efficiency, locations. Status right here, which this is cool. It gives you a overview. 
of when you were charging, when you're online, when you're actually driving in these brief little blips of purple. I have it parked 90, 97% of the time so far. Just, just some really cool stuff here. And something I literally installed today. This right here is Chasm. Do note there might be a little bit of bias. They're gonna be sponsoring a video in the future, so just keep note of that. If we go over to Workspaces, I have a Fedora 38 desktop as well as Tor browser. This is all running in Docker containers. So for example, if I'm uh, to open Fedora 38, want to open it up in the current tab, let's launch a session. This is cool because I'm probably gonna be replacing what I currently do, which is a Synology VM for this when it comes to externally connecting to my home network. So we have Chromium, Sublime Text, only Office, GIMP, Firefox, bunch of different stuff, and it's pretty quick. Whoa, allow. Let's open up Chromium. You can see it is very snappy. And for, I think it's VLC or VCL running this, it is very smooth and it works really good. For example, GIMP is kind of a beefier application. If we open that up, you can see it really didn't take long at all. Whole remote desktop kind of built into Docker containers, really easy to spin up. And you can see here, if I go back, this is the current instance I have up. It expires in 59 minutes, so it'll automatically delete and close that instance. So it adds a bunch of security. Of course, you could change that. You could keep them up for custom amount of time and whatnot. If I'm to go over to admin, you can set up a whole bunch of these if you want to. Let's go to workspaces, workspaces. And if I want to, Go to the workspace registry. This is the default registry that they have available. Rocky Linux, Parrot OS, we have only Office, GIMP, FileZilla, Doom. So if I open Doom, just click install. It's a fairly quick process. So if I go installed workspaces and just kind of let that do its thing for a minute. Hey, there we go. So let's go back over to our workspaces. And if I'm to open up Doom in the current, actually let's do this in a new tab, launch session. There we go. We have over here a little dashboard of everything that we have access to and y'all get the point. It's pretty cool. Also RetroArch is an option. So I think I'd be able to get like N60 or SNES games and stuff working. So that's basically it when it comes to the standard like kind of Docker container applications we have. All the other stuff is mostly network infrastructure and the actual dashboards for our NAS units. I have a Synology machine, an Unraid machine, and a Intel Nook running this Protainer. I've talked about Unraid quite a bit in the past. It is my favorite bar none NAS software that you could put on just about anything. It's really easy to manage your various shares. We have our dashboard here where we can see our shares, our statistics, all the Docker containers that I have running there. I really like how Unraid does it. If you go under apps, they're really mostly just Docker containers. You could pull them through here if I'm to install something such as, let's do Prometheus. I'm not actually going to install it. Just show you that it's for the most part, standard Docker kind of settings that you can set up and then everything is over here. Really easy just to update everything through here if you want to. Overall, I love Unraid if I'm to pick one thing to run every day versus Synology and kind of the kind of default Ubuntu server protainer instance I have up, it would definitely be Unraid. Now with that, I did mention I have a Synology NAS. Basically none of the Docker containers or anything like that are running through it. This primarily is just a file backup server, uh, mostly Synology photos. I have a lot of my uh, like phone pictures automatically synced to it through Synology photos. This runs my surveillance system, which is just like three cameras set up right now. I did use the virtual machine manager quite a bit. You can see I have a Windows 10 virtual machine, which is what I used to kind of connect to my uh, home network externally, I would log into this dashboard and use that virtual machine and run Windows as if I'm in my home network. That's kind of my use case for that. Over here, you see a little cloud check. I have cloud sync. I have a like video project archive in Google Drive. When I move things to the archive, it will automatically download into this server. So some pretty cool synchronization features in that regard. Additionally, I don't have a very complex like reverse proxy setup. I'm just using the uh, integrated kind of DDNS system, which will uh, IP addresses change here and there. So there's software built into this that will kind of recognize when your IP address changes and then update an A record automatically to change that IP address on the actual domain you use. I believe that's under external access. Yeah, right here we have uh, DDNS. Uh, Cloudflare is custom. I'm probably not gonna end up using that. And then the integrated Synology one is really nice.
And with that, if I go to Control Panel, Login Portal, Advanced, Reverse Proxy is hidden in here. And here you can see DSM, Plex, OP, Audiobook, Shelf, and Overseer. I all have set up through Reverse Proxy. This uses, um, I believe, CertBot. So everything has a SSL certificate. So just very nice, really easy to use system. I'm not in like a network administrator. I, my skill level's limited when it comes to that and just really easy to set up. For my firewall and all that, I just use a Synology router. It is linked up. They kind of integrate together really well. It's simple. It's not complex. It's not even worth diving into. I do have CenturyLink, like I said, so I'm using a PPPoE or something like that, so I don't have a separate like modem and router. It's just kind of all in one, really nice setup. And then last but not least, we have Protainer, which I did dive into a little bit earlier, but now since I opened up an instance, you could kind of see the Kavana, these two right here. This one's Doom and this one's Fedora. They will automatically delete after 60 minutes as I currently have it set up, so that's nice. And you can see all the other containers I have running through here, Protainer is almost a must on any system that you have Docker installed. It's just way easier to use than something like Rancher, in my opinion. I don't understand Kubernetes. But this for just spinning up like basic stacks, you can see some of the stacks right I have here. So if we go to my Teslamate stack, which I'm gonna end up having to blur a lot of it out, you can see here we have services and all the different containers that all kind of integrate and just are connected to each other. Really nice stuff, and that is basically my entire home lab setup, at least when it comes to the uh, software side of things. Down below, I'll link to a vast majority of everything that I talked about, including that deal on private internet access. If you are setting up a lot of this stuff, you are gonna want a VPN, and that is definitely the one I recommend and have been using for years. Now, with all that, I do hope you have an absolutely beautiful day. Have fun setting up your home lab. It is definitely uh, addicting and fun. You don't really need anything more than like a little Zima board, a little mini PC to get started. Even an old laptop or desktop you could probably find on like Facebook market for a hundred bucks, get an old like ThinkStation or something like that. It's fun, it's worth it, try it out. I do recommend an Intel machine for getting started, especially for like Plex hardware encoding, but even that's not necessarily necessary because if you have the right formats you don't need to have hardware encoding i could keep rambling on forever i'm gonna have to cut myself off and wish you a beautiful day and goodbye <laughs>